Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we are doing chapter 5 of our textbook, which is Microeconomics by Krugman, Wells, or and Parkinson. Now, this chapter is essentially about price controls and quotas, what are, uh, what are essentially quantity controls. And this is essentially when the government starts interfering in our market outcome. Now, last time we saw in chapter 4 that at equilibrium, total surplus is maximized, and that is essentially our efficient outcome. Typically, we'll say we'll see that most equilibrium outcomes are also efficient outcomes. In this chapter, we're essentially focus on, focusing on the fact that if the government is, con, is trying to distort the market outcome, what impact does it has on the market, on efficiency, and maybe perhaps the society as a whole. So let's look at what's the primary reason behind government controlling prices. Governments typically intervene in the market outcome if they have some type of equity concerns. They think that the market outcome is not the fair outcome. It's not how they see that the resources should be distributed in the in that particular economy. So for equity concerns, they feel that they need to either protect the buyers or the sellers of that particular product or service. So we see government intervening in the form of price controls. Price con controls are essentially what we call legal restrictions on how, on how high or low a market price may go. So price controls are of two types. They could be price ceilings or price floors, but we'll start our discussion with price ceilings today. A price ceiling is what we call a maximum price. This is the maximum price that the sellers are allowed to charge for a good or service. So the sellers can charge any price at that level or below it, but they cannot charge a price above that level. So that's why it's essentially called price ceiling. Once you hit the ceiling, price cannot go, uh, cannot go above that. So here's an example of the rental market. We have one bedroom about apartments over here and their quantity is in millions. So that's measured on the X axis. Price or the monthly rent of the apartment is on the Y axis. We have the demand and supply schedules and their corresponding curves plotted on this diagram. Now let's assume there is a Pmax over here which is set at a price that is higher than our equilibrium price. Equilibrium price you can see in this market is $1,000. So that's $1,000 per month and equilibrium quantity is where quantity supplied equals quantity demanded which is 2 million apartments. So if we set the price control let's say at Pmax, our Pmax is set at $1,200, what's the effect on the market? Now at Pmax, our corresponding quantity demanded and quantity supplied are not equal. Quantity supplied is 2.2 million, quantity demanded is only 1.8. So we can see that there is a surplus of the good in the market. We have surplus apartments available. Now we know that in, when, whenever we have a surplus of a good, it pushes the price down. But remember, this is a maximum price. This is a legal restriction on the price. So surplus is pushing the price down. So ask yourself, is the price allowed to go down? By definition, the maximum price is telling you that the government is saying that you cannot charge a price higher than this one. But it is not saying that you cannot charge a price lower than this Pmax. So if the Pmax is set at $1,200 per month, price is allowed to go down and the natural market forces will therefore push the price down because of the surplus and it will keep on going down till it hits our equilibrium price of $1,000 per month. At equilibrium, the surplus is eliminated, quantity supplied and quantity demanded are now back to 2 million apartments. So you can see this in this situation, this is what we call a non-binding maximum price or a non-binding price ceiling. This is not binding. Legally, it's still there, but it's not effective. It's like it's not there in the market. Market for forces will always, always bring back your equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity into effect. So whenever your Pmax is set above the equilibrium market price, it will be non-binding. It is almost as if it's not there at all. It has actually no impact on the market. Now let's do the opposite. Now we'll set our Pmax, which should be binding. And just you know, from our simple analysis in the previous slide, we can see for a Pmax to be binding, it should be set below the P star. Because Pmax by definition is saying that you cannot charge a higher price than this level. So if it is set below P star, 
it will become an effective or a binding price ceiling or a binding maximum price. So we look at our rental market again. Equilibrium price is $1,000 per month, which is the rental rate. And we have equilibrium quantity of 2 million apartments. Now, if a binding price, if a Pmax, let's say, is to start with, is set at $800 now per month, what is the effect on the market? Quantity demanded at this market price is a lot higher than quantity supplied. So we see there's a shortage of apartments in this market. We have a shortage, which is indicating quantity supplied and quantity demanded are not the same. Too many people willing to get an apartment at this rate, but not enough rent landlords willing to rent out their apartment units at this, at this particular rate. So what happens? We know in a free market, a shortage would push the price up. But is the price allowed to go up now? The price is not allowed to go up because this is a legal price control. The government has said that that this price is should be you know observed by everybody. You cannot, as a seller of apartment units or as a landlord for these units, you cannot charge a price higher than eight dollar eight hundred dollars a month. So we will be stuck with the shortage. So whenever we have a P max that's set below P star, it will become binding, and your shortage will persist. Another thing that I want you guys to ask yourself is, what is the exchanged quantity in this case? So how many apartments are actually bought or actually sold in this market at the binding price ceiling? We know that quantity demanded is 2.2, quantity supplied is 1.8 million apartment units, but how many of them are actually exchanged? Whenever we have quantity demanded and quantity supplied not equal to each other, note that the exchanged quantity or the bought quantity or the sold quantity, which we can use interchangeably all these three of them, is always the lesser of the two. In this case, quantity supplied is less than quantity demanded. So sellers are willing to rent out 1.8 million units of apartments, but quantity demanded is 2.2. So the exchange quantity or the actual sold quantity or the rented out apartment units would be in number would be only 1.8 million units. So exchange quantity is now lower than our equilibrium quantity of 2 million apartments, which we had when the market was at equilibrium price of $1,000 per month. So that's one effect of the binding price ceiling. It always creates a shortage, a shortage that's going to last now as long as this Pmax is binding or remains in place. And also it is going to cause your exchange quantity be lower than before or lower than what we had under a free market scenario where there was no government intervention. Price ceilings also have many other side effects. One of them we've already seen, it causes low quantity exchanged. We'll see that it also causes inefficient allocation to consumers. It will create wasted resources, inefficiently low quantity, and it also can lead to black markets. So let's go over them one by one. Inefficiently low quantity. Why are we calling this low quantity exchanged in this scenario inefficient? Note that when our exchange quantity is only 1.8 million units, here we are seeing missed opportunities for all of these units that were being exchanged when there was no price control. Now we have a situation where marginal benefit or the willingness to pay for these units exceeds the marginal cost for producing these units. So we have consumers who are willing to buy an apartment at a market price, which is lower than their willingness to pay. We have sellers who are willing to sell these units, or in this case, rent out these units at a market price, which is higher than, or equilibrium price, which is higher than their marginal cost of producing this unit. But this exchange is being limited. It's basically, we're not allowing this trade to occur. So these are all these missed opportunities for additional trade to occur and net gains to derive. So we are foregoing all of these gains and surplus equivalent to the shaded triangle over here because of our inefficiently low quantity being exchanged. This loss in surplus because of quantity being lower than Q star is called our dead weight loss. We'll go into further details about how consumers, producers are affected in this particular market. But before we go there, let's first look at what are the other side effects. So we also mentioned wasted resources as one possible side effect of a binding price ceiling. What do we mean by wasted resources? 
If you have shortages of a good, then you should expect long lines or people expending money, effort and time to cope with those shortages and, on, and trying to get that particular good or service. So shortages mean additional money, effort, time being spent. And when we have additional costs associated now with this, you know, with this good, that is the, that is the opportunity cost that is now incurred by consumers or producers or people in this market because of these long lineups. So these are people standing in lines to get the particular good. They're foregoing their wages. They're foregoing their leisure time. And these all constitute as our wasted resources in economies where we have these price ceilings in place like the USSR. We used to see back in the day um, that the Soviet Union used to have huge long lineups for just a loaf of bread. You know, a woman in general or on average used to spend at least two hours every day of the week in order to just get a loaf of bread or a bag of flour or you know some other staple item. So imagine the amount of opportunity cost associated with those shortages that are there just because of price ceilings in place. So price ceilings, while on the face of it, this seem like they are going to benefit our consumers, they actually do end up creating, uh, creating these inefficiencies and actually might um, make your consumers worse off because of the missed opportunities that they are now facing. Another side effect of price ceiling is that they end up creating inefficiently low quality. Note, this is forcing the price down. A binding price ceiling is below market price. So when we have a price that is now lower than before for the seller, it reduces their incentive to maintain the quality of the good and give you good quality as a customer. So we'll see redu a reduction in the quality of the good, reduction in the service being provided by the seller, and the, this in itself constitute an inefficiency in this particular market, which was not there earlier at your market price of P star. So in, you know, a common example is when you have rent controlled buildings or apartments, we will often see that they are badly maintained, they're, they're not kept properly, they are subject to frequent electro, uh, electrical or plumbing problems, and there might be, you know, crime rate in those buildings should, might be very high, security might not be provided to the residents. So it creates many other problems for the consumers who are going to rent those apartments or that particular good or service out. Another problem with price ceilings is that they may lead to black markets. Black market is when a good or service is being bought or sold illegally. Now, this could be because that the good or service is prohibited by law to be sold in the first place, or in our, as in our case, it could be because the equilibrium price is illegal. So the government says that the market price is illegal and the only legal price is P max or anything below P max. Now, how does a black market come up? Imagine you are in a rent controlled building and you want to get an apartment over there because the market rent in other units is around $2,000 a month. And this rent control building is only giving you a, you know, an apartment for $800 a month. So huge difference. We know there's a huge lineup. There are big shortages for this particular building. We see people trying to bribe landlords in order to get that particular unit. We are creating inefficiencies, which were otherwise not there. So while a black market is allowing trade to happen, it's essentially causing a lot of other inefficiencies which are really bad for the economy as a whole. So this was our diagram for the rent controls in place. And we know that the market price is $1,000. Maximum price is set at $800. What do you think will be the black market price? Black market price in this case would be essentially just look at your quantity exchanged of 1.8 million units. At this particular price, we know there is a huge lineup. There is a huge shortage. Now, sellers know this. And if they are able to sell this good illegally, they're going to sell it at a much higher price. They know consumers are willing to pay a lot higher than what the, the legal restriction is. So they will try and get away with the maximum possible that the consumers are willing to pay for this good. And the maximum possible is always given to you by the height of the demand curve. And in this case, that would be $1,200 per month. So our diagram over here is also giving us the black market price, the maximum price that the sellers can charge over here in this scenario. But this price will obviously be charged illegally behind closed doors or under the table, so to say. Let's now look at the effect on welfare for consumers and producers in this market specifically. Now we've already discussed that whenever you have efficiently low quantity being exchanged, in our case that was 1.8 million units of apartments, it did create those 
you know dead weight losses you know on our diagram the yellow triangle but now we want to go into the specifics of that what is the effect on consumers producers and therefore on total surplus so let's start with our diagram for the rent control market or which was our demand supply intersecting at a price of thousand dollars per month and equilibrium quantity is two million apartments if a rent control or binding price ceiling is imposed at $800, million, $800 per month, we see it created that shortage and your exchange quantity is now only 1.8. So this is important. When we're looking at the effect on surplus, you must note that what is your exchanged quantity. So let's look at our diagram in a little bit more detail and split these parts into different areas. So I label these parts as A, B, C, D, E, and we can calculate the area of each of these you know, regions to look at the dollar value of surplus. But for now, we'll just work with the labeling. Now, what is consumer surplus? Consumer surplus is your net benefit to consumers. I'm looking at consumer surplus before the rent control was put into place. So consumer surplus at your market price and at your market quantity, equilibrium quantity exchanged. So market price is $1,000 before the rent control and a quantity exchanged is Q star. So consumer surplus is the net gain to all consumers, which would be only area A and D. So bef below the demand curve, above the price, for all units till Q star or till 2 million units. So consumer surplus is your area A plus D. Producer surplus likewise remember is the net gain to producers who end up selling the good. So at the market price of $1,000 and with sold units at 2 million, producer surplus is the net gain of P minus the cost, which would be area below the price, above the supply curve, all the way till 2 million units, so all of this area. So that would be area B, C, and E. Total surplus is the summation of consumer surplus and producer surplus, so that would be A, B, C, D, and E, and these are all being summed up. So that's your total surplus when there was no rent control in place. Now let's impose the rent control. So now we are working with a price ceiling, which is binding at $800 per month, and exchange quantity is reduced to only 1.8 million units. We know there's a shortage, many more people willing to buy this good, but remember they're willing to buy, but not purchasing the good. So for us, they are redundant, or at least for this particular analysis, they don't really matter because they did not end up getting the good. Consumer surplus is only calculated for consumers who end up purchasing the good. So those are only these first 1.8 million consumers, assuming each consumer is buying or renting one apartment. So what's the consumer surplus over here? It's the area below the demand curve, above the price, till your quantity bought. Now quantity bought is only 1.8, so that would be area A and B. So because of the lower price, you can see area B is now also included in our consumer surplus. D was part of consumer surplus earlier, but these units are no longer being bought. So this exchange is not happening. So D cannot be part of our new consumer surplus after the rent control. Likewise, we repeat the same for producer surplus, net gain to producers. So net gain to producers would be producer surplus, which is price minus the cost for all units sold. Now, what is the market price? Market price in effect is $800, the price ceiling. So price minus cost for all the units sold, which would be only area C. So that's your producer surplus. Total surplus is the summation of these two. So that's the overall net gain because of this trade occurring or mutually beneficial trades happening from all the way zero to 1.8, which is area from below the demand curve, above the supply curve, till your 1.8 million units exchanged. So that is A, B, C, which is just a summation of consumer surplus and producer surplus. So that's our overall before and after situation. Let's look at the changes. By how much has consumer surplus changed? A was already there and it's still there. So we don't need to take care of, you know, we don't need to worry about A. We're focusing on the changes. Consumers have lost area D and they've gained area B. Let's compare producer surplus before and after. Producer surplus was B, C, E and now it's only C. So producers have lost B and lost E. So they have lost both B and E. And total surplus was A, B, C, D, E. Now it is only A, B, C. So produce total surplus, overall market surplus has or the gains from trade have been reduced by area D and E. Why did the consumers lose area D? Consumers have lost area D because for all of these units, they were willing to pay a price 
which was higher than the equilibrium price. But now these units are not being purchased by consumers. The quantity effect is transpiring into loss in consumer surplus of area D. Why did consumers gain area B? Because remember, whenever price goes down, your original buyers are now getting this good at a lower price. So it's causing your consumer surplus to increase. So there are two opposite effects on consumer surplus. They're losing some surplus because of the lower quantity consumed, but they're gaining some surplus because of the lower price for purchased units now. So two opposite effects. For producers, both are negative. They're receiving a lower price. So producer surplus is definitely falling by area B. So this is your price effect. And they're also selling less units. These units they could have sold earlier, but now they are not able to sell these additional units. So these 0.2 million units, they are unable to sell them, which they could easily have produced and sold at a price which is higher than the marginal cost of producing these units. So this, these are the missed opportunities for producers and they account for the loss in total surplus or loss in, in this case, producer surplus because of the lower quantity sold. So price effect, quantity effect, both are negative for producers. Overall, total surplus has been reduced by area D and E. So D and E are both quantity effect. Lower quantity exchanged is causing a loss in total surplus of area D and E. Note that area B, which was the price effect, is positive for consumers and negative for producers. So we have transfer of welfare from one party to the other. But the quantity effect is making both parties worse off. And that is what accounts for the deadweight losses that we discussed earlier. So this negative loss in surplus is what we call or account for as deadweight loss. So producers are definitely the losers over here because they are losing because of the lower price. They're losing because of the lower quantity exchanged. Some consumers are better off, the lucky ones who are getting the apartments at a lower price. They're gaining this surplus with area B. But there are some unlucky renters who are unable to get the apartments. These point 2 million apartments were rented out by those you know customers earlier now they are really unlucky because they have lost those apartments so consumers are could be overall better off or worse off depending upon which effect in dollar value is bigger but producers for sure or unambiguously are worse off or the losers of the situation next we'll look at price floors price floors are another type of price control imposed on the market by the government but in this case they're setting a price that pushes the market price typically up instead of down now what is the price floor it's a minimum price that buyers are required to pay for the good or service so now the legal price control is saying that you cannot charge a price lower than this level but you can always charge a price higher than this level so once the price hits the floor it cannot go any further down. That's why where the name is coming from, that it's a floor. Once you hit the floor, you cannot go down. A common example of the price floor is what we see in the labor market, and that is called your minimum wage. It's a legal floor on the wage rate, which is telling you that the market price of labor cannot fall below this particular level and can always go higher, but cannot fall below this particular level set minimum wage. So uh, other examples would be price stores on agricultural produce such as wheat, milk or other staple items which the government feels that the you know, farmers or producers of that particular good must be protected and they should be getting some fair price. So let's look at our example. Now in this case we have market of butter, we have demand and supply curves for the butter market and this is in millions of kilograms again so huge market again we're assuming it to be competitive market and now the government feels that this market price of butter at one dollar um, per kilogram of butter is too low so when the government feels that the price is too low and they need to help the producers they will set a binding price floor a binding price floor would be one that is set above the market price if it was set below the market price it would simply become non-binding. So for example, if I had set it over here, this will create a shortage. A shortage, you know, pushes the price up. And remember in a price floor, the price is allowed to go up. It's just not allowed to go down below that level. So if we set a minimum price below your equilibrium price, it's simply non-binding. So, you know, it's ineffective. The shortage pushes the market price up, you will go back to $1 per unit and equilibrium quantity will come back to 10 units or 10 million kilograms of butter in this case. So in order for your price floor to be binding, it must, it must be set above the market price. So let's set it above the market price. If it's set at $1.20, for example, you can see at the corresponding 
points on the two curves that our quantity supplied is now a lot higher than a quantity demanded. Quantity supplied is 12 kilograms of butter or 12 million kilograms of butter and quantity demanded is only 9 million kilograms of butter. So it creates a surplus. This difference between the two is the surplus of the good that, that has been created. Now with the surplus you know that quantity exchanged is now going to be lower than our equilibrium quantity that was in place initially. Now if quantity demanded is 9, quantity supplied is 12 as I said earlier whenever we have a discrepancy between the two it's the lower of the two which will be traded or the exchanged or sold quantity in this market so quantity bought is only 9 million kilograms of butter sellers are producing 12 but able to sell only 9 so your exchanged quantity is only 9 million kilograms of butter which is lower than before now legally we cannot take the price below this minimum price now, what type of inefficiencies do we see when we have a binding minimum price in place? One obviously obvious one is your is the deadweight loss. Whenever you see exchange quantity below Q star, you'll see your total surplus declining and that reduction in surplus is referring to referred to as your dead weight loss so, and we'll go over the diagram again for the scenario as well to see the details of how the dead weight loss emerges another side effect is we'll have inefficient allocation of sales we'll again have wasted resources and now unlike the previous case where we had low quality we'll have an inefficiently high quality of the good. So let's go over them one by one. The first one is coming from your low quantity. When the exchanged quantity is only 9 million kilograms of butter, we are foregoing these opportunities. All of these consumers are willing to pay a price which is higher than the cost of producing this good. So these are mutually beneficial trades which could have occurred but are now not occurring. They are limited from occurring because of the imposition of the legally binding minimum price or the price floor. So because we have these missed opportunities, it reduces our surplus by the area amounting to this yellow triangle and this is what we call our deadweight loss. Recall from chapter 4 that under the equilibrium outcome, High cost firms are not allowed to produce. So if our equilibrium price is P star and this is your supply and demand curve respectively, these high cost firms are not producing and selling the good at your market price of P star. The market is automatically allocating sales or production of the good to low cost firms. Now what's happening with the price control over here? With the minimum price, we're allowing these high cost firms to operate. So we are creating an inefficiency in the market because the good is now being produced by firms which are producing it at too high a cost and therefore it is you know it's an inefficiency because we could have easily produced the good at a much lower cost so it's it preventing low cost firms to enter the industry because if high cost firms are producing the good they're automatically also going to charge higher prices we can use the example of transatlantic airfares to demonstrate this problem. So in the 1970s, we had international treaties setting the transatlantic airfares and they were they would set them as, you know, artificially high, too high, much higher than the market equilibrium price. Since the deregulation of that particular industry, we have seen that transatlantic airfares have gone down drastically and number of people taking these flights has increased by more than 400%. So you can see many many more people now entering the industry selling the good at a much lower price because of the deregulation so when you remove the price floor it will lower the price and will it, and it will increase the equilibrium price uh, sorry increase the equilibrium quantity exchange just like price ceilings we'll also end up seeing wasted resources in the in the case of a price floor remember price floors create a surplus of the good and in order to ensure that the price floor remains in place, it remains binding, government has to ensure that the surplus does not enter the market. And that's why we typically see that governments often buying this unwanted surplus and they would, you know, send it off to some other countries or in some cases they would actually also just simply destroy it or throw it away. The idea over here is that if the surplus enters the market, it will push the price back down to equilibrium. And if you want to maintain the price control, the surplus must be gotten rid of. So it is creating a lot of wastage of resources and creating inefficiencies. Uh, price floors will also create another type of inefficiency and that is artificially high quality. Consumers are not willing to pay for this high quality. When sellers are producing the good at a higher price, they're offering their consumers a higher quality also. But the problem is that buyers are not willing to pay for the higher quality. They could have easily bought the good at a lower price and higher quantities of it. So because 
buyers are not paying for what they really wanted for the what they really wanted this is an inefficiently high quality of the good that is being produced and again leading to wastage of resources let's now look at our winners and losers of the price floor but basically we'll again go back to the market diagram and look at the specific effect of uh, on welfare of consumers welfare of producers and how deadweight losses emerge in this market so we are looking at the market for butter we have demand and supply for bucket butter equilibrium market price is one dollar equilibrium quantity exchange is 10 million kilograms of butter at equilibrium let's look at consumer surplus producer surplus and total surplus so I'll superimpose the price floor as well and then split this diagram into various parts. So we have different parts shaded over here and also labeled as A, B, C, D, E. Now what is consumer surplus? Consumer surplus before the price floor. That means we're effectively working with equilibrium price and quantity, P star and Q star. Consumer surplus is area below the demand curve, above the price, till the quantity exchanged. So if our P star is over here, this is our exchange quantity. So our consumer surplus is all of this area, area A plus B plus C. Producer surplus is the net gain to producers, below the price above the supply curve so net gain to producers summed up over all of these units sold that would be area d and e and total surplus is a summation of the two or net gains or the gains from trade that emerge because of this good being exchanged so these are all mutually beneficial trades that are occurring all the way till 10 million kilogram of butter so that's area a b c plus d and e so that's our total surplus let's now look at the effect on surplus once we have the price control in place again go back to your basic definition of consumer surplus and producer surplus so consumer surplus is below the demand curve but now above the minimum price till your units bought now units bought are now only 9 million kilograms of butter so that would be only area a unlike before it was a b c producer surplus below the minimum price and above the supply curve till the quantity exchange so that would be area b and d unlike before which was area d and e and total surplus instead of being a b c d e it is now only a b and d so a plus b plus d so these are um, the area below the demand above the supply curve till the quantity exchange or you can sum up consumer surplus per plus producer surplus and you can see it's your total surplus over here let's now look at the specifics how has consumer surplus changed consumer surplus was a much bigger triangle now it's much smaller so consumers have lost b and lost c producer surplus was d and e it has now also seen some drastic changes producers have gained b but they have lost e and for the effect on total surplus we can see it was initially all of this area a b c d e now it's only a b d so total surplus has lost area C and E. And remember C and E is the loss in your total surplus. So this is equivalent to our deadweight loss. So whenever we have lower quantity, that creates deadweight losses. Now let's see the price effect and the quantity effect. Why am I saying lower quantity is creating the deadweight losses? Price effect for consumers. The price effect for consumers is definitely negative. They were paying a dollar per, per kilogram of butter. Now they're paying dollar 20. So price as it goes up, it reduces a consumer surplus. Consumers who end up still buying the good as before, they're paying a much higher price. So consumers lose area B because of the price effect. Now consumers are also consuming lower quantity. They are not receiving these units. They were willing to pay a price higher than the market equilibrium price, but these trades are now not occurring. So the consumed quantity is now lower than before. So area C is a loss in consumer surplus because of their lower quantity. So higher price effect, loss in area B, lower quantity effect for consumers, area C. Producer surplus. Producers are gaining a higher price or receiving a higher price for these units sold. So, so the 9 million units of kilogram of butter being sold, they receive a higher price. So some producers are definitely better off and they are gaining the surplus amounting to area B. So that's their price effect. Higher price is good for the producers. But at the same time, this price floor is effectively reducing the quantity sold. So quantity sold when it is reduced they are not now they're not able to sell these units and that amounts to the loss in surplus for producers equivalent to areas e so lower quantity effect you can see 
is what is amounting to your dead weight losses. So whenever we have quantity exchange lower than our equilibrium quantity, it will cause total surplus to go down and it will create these dead weight losses. You can calculate the area of the triangle C and E together or separately as C plus E and that would amount to your total loss in surplus uh, in dollar value. Specifically over here, consumers are definitely the losers of this policy. They are paying a higher price, consuming less than before. So they, are, they have definitely a much bigger loss over here. Producer surplus, it depends upon these two areas, B and D. From this diagram, it seems like producers are definitely better off, but it would really depend upon the shape of the curves you're working with. So producers could be winners overall. Um, so producers who end up selling these, this, you know, this butter, they are definitely the lucky ones. They end up getting a higher price, but some producers are not going to be as lucky because they are unable to sell their butter. So not everybody is happy in this outcome. Only producers who end up selling the butter at a higher price will be better off. Overall, market is worse off because total surplus has been compromised. So we have an inefficiently low quantity of the good being exchanged because you know the, we have all of these missed opportunities. Another very good example of a price floor in our daily lives that we talk about or hear about or actually observe is the minimum wage. Minimum wage is a price floor that is placed in the labor market and it creates unemployment. So here I have the diagram for the labor market. We have labor demand, which is downward sloping, labor supply, which is upward sloping, and we have wage rate, which is the price of labor on the Y axis. Quantity of labor is on the X axis. So labor, wage rate, labor supply, and labor demand. Note that your supply of labor is coming from households. Remember we are, as households, we are owners of factors of production. So workers are essentially coming from houses or households and they're selling their labor services. So workers are selling their labor. So quantity supplied of labor rises as wages go up. And that's why you see this positive upward sloping curve. What is labor demand? Labor demand comes from firms or from the employers. So quantity demanded of labor will fall as wage rate rises. Why? Because for the firms, wage is a cost of production. The higher the wage rate, they have to pay their workers that higher cost. So typically when the wage rate goes up, quantity demanded of, for workers or for labor will decrease. So negative relationship for these two. Of course, these are Cetris Peribus relationships. So holding everything else constant, we have a upward sloping labor supply curve and a downward sloping labor demand curve. Equilibrium in the market is where quantity demanded equals quantity supplied and in this particular example it is, it is at $8.5 per hour of labor effort let's say and our quantity demanded for labor and quantity supplied of labor are equal at around let's say assume this to be some number in between so at 1000 units of labor. Now the units of labor could be in number of hours worked or in terms of you know actual number of people working in the labor force. So for now for simplicity let's assume this has thousands of workers. If we impose a price floor, a minimum wage in this market, what is the effect? So a minimum wage remember is saying that the wage rate cannot fall below this level. It can be at this level or higher than this level. So a binding minimum wage would have to be set above your market price, or in this case, above the equilibrium wage rate. So if we set our minimum wage above 8.5, it's a binding minimum wage. If it was set below 8.5, it would be non-binding. Because remember, by definition, a price floor says that you can charge a higher price, but you cannot charge a lower price. So if you were to set your minimum wage at $7 an hour, it would create a you know shortage in the market and the shortage pushes the wage rate up and you'll go back to equilibrium so it's non-binding so a binding minimum wage is set above your equilibrium wage rate now what's the effect of this wage rate on the market at the minimum wage of ten dollars an hour you can see that quantity demanded and quantity supplied are not equal to each other at minimum wage of 10 quantity supplied of labor is 1200 quantity demanded is 900 and it creates a surplus of labor in this market. Surplus of labor is essentially what we call unemployment. When we have too many workers willing to work, but not enough jobs for them. So at our minimum wage, quantity demanded is 900 workers. Quantity supplied is 1,200 workers. So anybody who's willing to work in this labor market is now 
what amounts to your labor force. People who end up getting a job are your employed workers. So these are all who end up with a job because firms are looking for 900 workers in this case. And now out of these 1200, only 900 are employed. So the remaining 300 are your unemployed workers. So the surplus of labor is creating unemployment at your minimum wage. Who are the winners and who are the losers? Winners are those workers who end up with a job and are getting paid a higher wage rate than before. So all of these 900 million or 900,000 workers who end up with a job and are paid at the higher wage rate are definitely the winners of this policy. Who is worse off? These workers. They are they had a job, they are definitely worse off now because they are out of work. They have been laid off. Who, why are these worse off? These are your additional, you know, let's say 200 workers who were not even part of the labor force earlier, but now they are looking for work, but unable to find one. So this 100 lost a job and this 200 is now entered the labor force, but unable to find a job. Together, this is your 300, which is unemployed over here, this surplus of labor. What about the firms? Firms are definitely worse off because they're paying a higher wage rate and they're hiring less workers than before. They were hiring, let's say 1,000 workers or 1,000, 1, 000, a million workers before. Now they are hiring a lot less than that. So firms are definitely worse off and labor, it depends. Do you end up with a job? Or do you end up looking for work? It, you are, the lucky ones are definitely better off. Next, we're going to look at controlling quantities directly, which are also called your quotas. Now note when we were talking about price controls, whether it was a minimum price or a maximum price, a price ceiling or a price floor, it did end up controlling your quantity as well. Yes, there were shortages and surpluses, but the exchange quantity north was always lower than our equilibrium quantity. So in our Pmax, quantity exchange is lower. In our P minimum or price floor, quantity exchange is lower. But this is an indirect way of controlling our quantity exchanged. Quota directly puts a quantity control or a restriction on the amount of the good that can be exchanged. Now the restriction is not on the price at which, is, at which it is being exchanged, but the restriction is on the quantity of the good that can be exchanged and it's an upper limit on the quantity that you cannot sell more than this particular units of this good or service. So we look at the example of taxi licenses. So taxi licenses are often controlled by the city government. They will not just allow anybody to operate a taxi. You have to have a taxi medallion or a taxi license to operate a taxi or a cab in a particular area or jurisdiction. So quota limit will be the amount that you can actually sell or can be legally exchanged in this uh, in this particular market. So let's look at our example of uh, taxi markets. So we have quantity of taxi rides, which are in millions per year. And we have the taxi fare per ride on the y-axis, which is the price of the taxi ride per ride. So let's say our demand curve is given by this demand schedule over here supply curve is given by the supply schedule in this table together we have our two curves and the equilibrium in this market is at five dollars per ride and the equilibrium quantity exchanged is 10 million rides now a quantity control will put a restriction on the quantity exchange and here again binding quota would be only if it is below your equilibrium quantity a non-binding quota can be set at 11, 12, 13. Note if it's set at too high a level above your equilibrium quantity, it's simply non-binding because the market will only just, you know, follow the equilibrium quantity in that case. So binding quota has to be set below your equilibrium quantity exchanged. So we can set a quota over here at, let's say, 10, um, lower than 10, so 8, 9, maybe 7 million rights. Now, what is a demand price. In order to understand the impact of the quota, we have to look at you know the demand price and the supply price or the seller price. Demand price of a given quantity is simply the price at which consumers will demand that specific quantity. Or remember willingness to pay, the height of the demand curve, this is the maximum price that consumers are willing to pay for a given quantity. Supply price or the seller's price for a given quantity is the price at which producers are willing to supply that particular quantity. So for a given quantity, what is the minimum acceptable price? That is your supply price. Remember the height of the supply curve that gives you the minimum acceptable price or the marginal cost of producing that particular quantity. 
that is now being referred to as the supply price. So we have seen these concepts by using, you know, some slightly different terms before, but it's essentially the same thing. So demand price is given by the height of the demand curve, and it is the price that consumers are willing to pay for the good for that particular quantity and likewise for the supply price. So let's look at demand price and supply price when a quota is imposed. So let's say a quota is in this place is in this market is placed at 8 million rides per year. What is the demand price? Demand price is the maximum price that consumers are willing to pay for this particular quantity. So our demand price is $6 per ride. What is the supply price? It's the minimum acceptable price for the sellers when they supply this good or at which they are willing to supply this particular quantity. So the quantity is now held constant by the government. We cannot sell more than 8 million rights. We cannot buy more than 8 million rights. So you can see there's a discrepancy over here. Demand price and supply price are not the same. It's creating a wedge. So our demand price is a lot higher than our supply price. And this wedge is what we call the quota rent. And the wedge is creating our deadweight loss triangle also. Just like in our previous diagrams, if the quantity exchange is lower than equilibrium quantity, it creates these missed opportunities. All of these mutually beneficial trades for both buyers and sellers are now being foregone. And that is creating the loss in total surplus, which can be accounted for in do dollar value by calculating the area of this triangle, which would be equivalent to our deadweight loss created because of the imposition of this quota. Now let's go back to quota rent or the wedge. The quota rent is the difference between the demand price and the supply price. Now this quota rent is per ride. If I just look at the difference, it is per ride. So that's six minus four. The quota rent per ride in this case is $2 per unit or $2 per ride. Sellers of the good are getting $2 in rent or additional on top of what is their minimum acceptable price or what is their marginal cost of producing this particular quantity. If I want to look at overall quota rent, that would be the total earnings accrued to the license holder because of the fact that they're owning that particular license. So our total quota rent would be the wedge times this total quantity. So for taxi drivers or the sellers of the good in this market, the quota rent is equivalent to this entire area, which would be two times 8 million. So that is worth $16 million. Another thing you should ask yourself is at what price are these taxi rides are now selling for? So what's the price per ride once the quota has been imposed? Are we selling the ride for $6 as sellers, $5, which was the initial equilibrium price, or are we selling them at $4 per unit or $4 per ride? Note that demand curve is giving you the willingness to pay for this particular quantity. So willingness to pay, the maximum willingness to pay for consumers for this quantity is $6 per ride. So if there's no restriction on what price they can charge, of course, the sellers are going to charge the highest possible price. So the price that is effective now under the quota is $6 per ride. Like our previous diagrams, you can now next do the effect on consumer surplus, producer surplus, and total surplus. So our effective price is $6 or the demand price. And we can split the diagram into different parts and calculate our consumer surplus, producer surplus. Note you will end up again getting deadweight losses equivalent to area E and F. Your consumer surplus after the quota is only area A and your producer surplus after the quota is area B, C, and D. Why B, C, and D? Because note the price that is effectively being charged is $6 per unit, the demand price. So producer surplus is below the price, above the supply curve, till your quantity exchanged of 8 million. So effect over here on consumer surplus and producer surplus is similar to that of a price floor, but the reason is not a price floor. Here the reason is a direct restriction on quantity or what we call our quota limit. So that brings us to the end of chapter five. Next week, we'll work on elasticity of demand and supply and specifically on how elasticity can affect the revenue earned by firms in a particular market.